Hi guys, how are you? It is presently Tuesday at 9.30 a.m. on the West Coast. We've changed the time of our Instagram Live today to accommodate our wonderful guest, Dr. Alan Bauman. He is a hair and scalp expert from Boca Raton, Florida. And um, we really want to talk to him today because we know that COVID has caused a lot of stress, but <laughs> where do we see stress? One of the places is our hair. So um, just to tell you a little bit about Dr. Bauman, he was named one of 10 CEOs transforming healthcare in America. And he was voted the number one top um, hair restoration surgeon by Aesthetic Magazine. So he owns also and runs a 12,000 square foot medical center in Boca Raton, Florida. He's treated nearly 20,000 patients and done 8,000 um, hair transplant surgeries. So when we talk about someone who knows the industry, that would be him. Okay, Dr. Bauman, let's see if we can connect. There we go. Um, the other thing, my favorite topic is scalp love. How many times have we given our scalp the right attention? Hi, Dr. Bauman. Hey, Hi. Kim. Great to be with you. Great to be with you. The last Great time to we were you. together. Yeah, and we were together on Global Wellness Day. Let's see, was that June 13th? And you gave a wonderful presentation on their 24-hour live stream. That was super exciting. Although, you know, I think the guy before me like did a base jump or something like that with a wingsuit. <laughs> so, you know, that was a pretty hard act to follow, you know, when talk about hair and scalp wellness. But um, I know. yeah, what no, it was really great to be with you, obviously. <laughs> Hopefully people, I don't know if people who are tuning in for the uh, the wind in that guy's hair uh, were sticking around <laughs> to see the uh, the information on hair wellness. But um, it was it was great. It was awesome to be a part of that. Super well, exciting. Well, you know what? Um, this is a We all have hair, right? We all have a scalp. And, you know, I personally think bald men are very attractive, but often they don't think so, right? So... Right. Men and women uh, love their hair and uh, usually want to keep it. <laughs> so that's where you come in. Now... We have so much to talk about. We met because you are the actual um, hair doc for a new uh, resort on Palm Beach, in Palm Beach County on Singer Island called Omrit Ocean Resort and Residence. This is not open yet, but you will actually be helping their scalp spa, which I love that name. And we'll get into specifics about how you're going to treat hair there and how you treat it in your center in Boca. But first of all, we're here to talk about surviving COVID. We want to be inspired by leaders. So tell us, Dr. Bauman, as the world slowly emerges from the pandemic, how has your business or your industry been affected? Yeah, so obviously as a physician who performs elective procedures, and we obviously were coming in close contact with patients, uh, the COVID situation is quite concerning. And here in Florida, elective procedures were basically banned, forbidden for about six weeks or so on the order of the governor. So um, my practice was physically shut down in terms of surgeries and other treatments like regenerative medicine technologies and such. And around the world, uh, it's very, it was very much the same. So when we would gather with physicians, Zoom conferences and things like that, you know, we would hear about how many physicians just closed their doors completely, uh, furloughed their employees, you know, sent their employees home, and uh, you know, we're 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 kind of floundering. Um, we did something a little bit different. Um, I kept all of my employees on staff and uh, we came up with some pretty innovative ideas to be keeping in contact with our patients uh, by phone and by virtual conferencing and Zoom and you name it uh, to keep in close contact with them. So, uh, you know, it was a pretty, pretty tough time for the industry. You know, the, the quickest way to, to make a surgeon crazy is to tell him he can't operate, you know. Right, right. And, you know, you're so comfortable when we interviewed you on Zoom. You're very comfortable. And it's nice. I had a doctor's appointment and we did it on via phone. And I was like, well, that was kind of nice. Um, tell me, we're going to jump around because we have so much to talk about. Um, tell me through all of this, what was your toughest day as a leader? And what was your best day? 
Well, uh, I have to say that the, the toughest day was actually my birthday because that was the news. That day I got the news uh, from the governor that elective procedures were going to be on hold. So um, we had to make a very, I mean, we knew things were coming to that uh, point, I think. Right. Uh, there was some inkling that that was going to happen. We didn't know exactly when it was going to actually take effect. So we had already been in preparation, making things uh, different at the office in terms of the way that we saw patients, uh, separate patients, protect patients, protect the staff as well. Right. Um, but that was the day it became a harsh reality, you know, an executive order comes down from the governor of the state of Florida. And so we had to make some very tough decisions at that moment, uh, how we were going to proceed and, you know, uh, you know, make a decision as to what exactly to do, because it's a bit unknown, right? So someone says, uh, without your consent, essentially, as a entrepreneur and business owner and, and clinic owner and building owner and so forth, with 20 mouths to feed, you know, meaning that I've got my staff, I have over 20 full time staff, right. what are we going to do with them? And so, uh, you know, we really put pen to paper and said, uh, you know, let's make a plan here, based on our best available knowledge, and move forward with it. But, um, you know, that was a that was a shaky time, I have to say, and uh, a scary time because, right. you know, in the beginning when I started the practice, obviously we didn't expect to have any patients when we started, um, but to have a, uh, a, a practice that was up and running and then to be uh, essentially paused and right. delayed, um, you know, without a lot of warning. And of course, everybody's life is turned upside down by the, the situation. Um, you know, that was a tough day. Yeah, for sure. I bet. There was no, I, there was no birthday cake going on. I no, mean, no, was, no. <laughs> I was blowing out the candles, hoping that, um, you know, the practice that I worked uh, to build over the past 25 years would still be here to talk about, you know, yeah. in a few weeks or months. So yeah, that was some tough stuff. And now what was the best day you've had? since this shutdown. Don't say Global Wellness Day because I know that's probably it. For oh, well, that was a close second. That was exciting. <laughs> um, no, I'd have to say getting the word that um, elective procedures could resume uh, and that we could basically move forward with our plan, actually even a little bit earlier than what we had thought. Oh. So, um, you know, without going into great detail, essentially what we had planned was a certain amount of time to be paused and delayed. And I had rescheduled patients uh, for that time that we anticipated to be back open. And to get the word from the governor, uh, it was pretty exciting. Uh, you know, our phones were buzzing. Uh, literally, as soon as the words elective procedures left his mouth during the press conference, um, you know, we, we had patients who were ready to go. Obviously, there's quite a backlog uh, when wow. you're down for six weeks. Right, right. So. Well, you know, the Global Wellness uh, Summit and Institute does research, and they have identified as of 2020 that the global wellness economy is a $4.5 trillion economy. And I never cease to be amazed that personal care and beauty is $1,083 billion. It's the biggest sector of that sure. economy. And when you think about the way people feel, there's a four-year initiative that the Institute did called Beauty to Wellness, and it linked your emotional and you know, mental health to how you feel about how you're presented in the world. So how does that lead to hair health? What would you say? How many people on average lose hair in a year? And what do you do about it? Yeah, well, to sum it up, uh, my dad said it best. Look sharp, be sharp, uh, you feel sharp. So, um, you know, that would be his uh, quick answer. But, um, you know, hair loss affects nearly 100 million American men and women out there. And uh, almost equally between the sexes, about 50 million men and 30 to 46 million women out there. But what we do know is the effect on the quality of life. And so that's what you're seeing when you look at those numbers uh, in the wellness industry, that people look at their hair as a sign of expression, as a sign of how we communicate as human beings to each other. Yeah. And not to say that it's mandatory, because it's certainly not mandatory for life. There are many alopecia patients who um, are proud to go completely bald and uh, wear their hair shaven. And men uh, can shave their head and be socially acceptable. I mean, maybe it's, it's a little easier for... Yeah, maybe a little bit easier for them if they have a goatee or an earring or a motorcycle or something. But, if, you know, if that look is not the right one for you uh, and you would like to look better and feel better with hair, then you're going to seek some kind of treatment um, and hopefully some kind of advice from a qualified professional. Yeah, you know, I really love uh, all the tips online. I didn't bring them here today, but 
there's many things you can eat, soybeans, protein, you know, nuts. There's so many things that can feed the biotin and feed the protein in your hair. But beyond a diet, which does take a while, what sort of uh, things do you tell people to do to keep their scalp and hair healthy? Yeah, so nutrition is obviously important because hair follicles are one of the most metabolically active uh, cell populations in your entire body, um, up, right up there with like bone marrow and your GI tract and so forth. And that's one of the reasons why chemotherapy knocks that out, right? So rapidly dividing cells, hopefully cancer, um, and but these other things can cause some side effects. But what we do know is that there's a lot you can do if you have some disruption of hair follicle function. We First of all, we would like to measure it so that we would like to take a look at your scalp. We can measure it very, very specifically now using microscopic magnification to look at the quality of the hair, the density of the hair that's growing on the scalp. We can also look very carefully using uh, instrumentation to physically measure how much hair is growing in each different zone. And that will help us create a diagnosis as well as benchmark your treatments over time. But basic categories of therapy can fall into simple things like risk reduction. So just like, as, a, as you said, nutrition, well, of course, um, reducing your stress and the impact of the stress or being more mindful, uh, reducing those stress spikes can certainly help grow better quality hair and eliminate the shedding. You can um, make sure that your scalp is as healthy as it can be. So if there's inflammation or itching or irritation there, let's get that taken care of. If there's some disruption in your sleep cycle, we know that the body clock is the master clock, the circadian rhythm, if you will, has control over these other um, micro clocks, if you will, or peripheral clocks, like the ones that are in the hair follicle that turn the follicle on and off over time wow. is really, really critical. Um, so there's a lot that we can do to address the hair loss issue, um, even before we get to medications and medical devices like lasers and things like that that are non-chemical and regenerative medicine technologies like PRP and platelet-rich plasma and so forth. Um, it, it is obviously, amazing. You know, if the follicles ask. are dead and gone though, Kim, then obviously we need to do some transplants. So um, the idea is to try to protect your hair when you can, when you still have it. Yeah, and I don't think people are thinking that way, prevention and jumping right in there. Like, you know, I even saw here in LA a couple of years ago, a scalp spa, and I was like, take me there. Now, here's some of the treatments on the Omrit menu from your brilliant mind, purifying, rebalancing, soothing, um, and also those are for scalp and hair loss, um, and their stem cells that are, attract, are um, applied. What is the name of the hair science? It's not riding a tricycle. What is it? Trichology, yes. Yeah. So all of those <laughs> things that you've just mentioned are based solidly in the science of trichology, which is, yeah, not riding a tricycle. Trichology would be the study of the hair and the scalp. So literally the health and wellness of the scalp, which is considered the fertile ground, right, for good quality hair growth. That's where the follicles are embedded. The follicles are al alive, literally microorgans, and hopefully you've got about 150,000 of them there up on your scalp in your forest, if you will. And uh, those follicles are going to produce hair, which is a dead tissue, kind of like your fingernails. So it's really important for that environment that the, that the follicles are living in, that micro environment, to be super healthy. We know for sure, science tells us if there's inflammation, if there's some activity um, detrimental going on that's unhealthy at the level of the scalp, you're not going to grow good quality hair. <laughs> so those treatment modalities that you mentioned are based on an evaluation protocol. So we can measure scalp pH, moisture level, sebum level. Um, we can look for signs of inflammation, flaking, dryness, um, scaling, sores, things like that. Even acne on the scalp is common. Wow. And so we want to rectify those things and treat them over time in order to improve hair follicle function. Well, tell me, can you ever grow hair back after loss? Because women, especially facing menopause, a lot of women get really thin in the hair. Um, is there any hope for that? Or should it be, is there only one way to go? 
Well, no, no, no. Of course there's hope and help. I mean, obviously you want to identify your risk factors, you know, genetically, or is there hair loss in the family? Uh, some of the things that we talked about in terms of lifestyle ahead of time before, um, you know, we want to evaluate that. But if the follicle is still there, not dead and gone, then absolutely we've got a lot of opportunity to protect its function and to enhance it uh, in all the different modalities that we just mentioned, whether it be reducing risks, making sure the scalp is healthy, could be non-chemical treatments nutritionally, uh, could be medications that we apply topically or regenerative medicine technologies like platelet-rich plasma and things like that. And all of those things can really help protect and enhance hair follicle function. These are all modalities, Kim, that we didn't have years ago um, when literally everything else was just transplants or not. Yes. Um, you know, and today, you know, if we need to, of course, women who have depleted density and men as well, can undergo hair transplantation where we take the individual follicles one at a time from the back of the scalp. So it's not like the old days. It's not a plug procedure. It's not painful. It's not going to leave you with a nasty linear scar or something like that. Uh, no stitches or staples. We actually have robotic technology and other tools that we use to move those follicles around to relocate them in the forest, so to speak, into the areas that are thinning and balding. So Wow. But there's a lot that we can do to help regenerate the function of those follicles. Absolutely. So since not everybody listening, you know, because we have a global audience, we'll be able to come and see you. Can you give us five tips? Like, what should we do every week? Like, I stand in the shower and I wash my hair. And I'm like, what should I be doing for my scalp right now? What am I not knowing to do? What would you say? Yeah. So, well, first of all, just uh, for people who are uh, distant from us here in Boca Raton, Florida, I think it's important to note that one of the things that the pandemic helped us do is refine our virtual consultation process. So we do consult with patients from all over the world, virtually through Zoom and other modalities um, to really see what's going on. And of course, if there's something that we identify that they need help with in their location, we try to refer if we can, but we certainly want to connect with them. Um, but five important things that you can do. I mean, gosh, number one, you want to make sure that if you're at risk for hair loss, that you seek advice from a hair restoration physician, someone who's qualified, you know. Um, number two, don't panic. So you don't want to be out there, um, you know, searching for some magic vitamin or some sexy shampoo that really doesn't have any uh, therapeutic value at all, especially if we don't know what necessarily the problem is. Um, Again, don't wait. So early treatments are the best treatments. So if we're going to start something like a topical medication or laser light device, um, we want to make sure that we, um, you know, we get that started as soon as possible, for sure. Probably number four would be uh, to measure. So uh, get access to a measurement tool so that we can track the progress over time. And uh, that's one of the benefits of actually physically coming into the office. Many of our long distance patients will take the trip uh, maybe twice a year, once or twice a year for sure, to benchmark and know how their treatments are going. And, uh, you know, and I guess uh, probably, again, the most important thing is to connect with a, uh, an experienced, certified, credentialed uh, hair restoration specialist out there. And that's probably not your local dermatologist uh, or your local plastic surgeon out there. Someone who does hair restoration on a full-time basis is going to be able to have those tools and techniques and opportunities to give you really the, the best evaluation, diagnosis, risk assessment, and build a very appropriate and powerful treatment plan for you. Well, we have a question that keeps coming up. Do you know anything about Nizarol, N-I-Z-A-R-O-L shampoo? Yes. What, what is that? So Nizarol is wow. an antifungal shampoo that contains ketoconazole. And so for many patients with irritated scalps, um, dermatologists will often recommend an antifungal shampoo, but it also has an interesting other benefit. And uh, the other benefit of, of ketoconazole is that it's an anti-androgen. And we know that androgens are really critical in degrading the hair follicle function if you're susceptible to that, if you're androgen sensitive, right? So male and female pattern hair loss is called androgenetic alopecia, and it's a sensitivity to those androgens. So it can have a twofold benefit, the ketoconazole shampoo. Um, as I said before, anti-inflammatory, well, anti-inflammatory as well as antifungal, as well as this anti-androgen uh, component. But there's one major downside to the Nizarel shampoo and that it's very, very harsh on the scalp and on the hair. 
So even though it has this therapeutic value, it has a lot of, of, of cosmetic detriments. So people find it, I've used it myself. Um, I've found it very difficult to use. My hair is a bit long and um, it dries out my scalp. My scalp happens to be very sensitive. So I find that it's untenable for me and for also many patients who are trying to um, have a nice style and, and, and condition their hair properly, especially if they have thinning hair, um, it can be a problem. So uh, Nizerol is not necessarily the greatest idea uh, for that reason. We do have therapeutic shampoos that contain ingredients like caffeine and salt palmetto and green tea, which can affect the health of the scalp. Um, the Bauman MD line of products, which is a product line that I developed starting back in 1999, um, has a therapeutic shampoo that is a DHT control shampoo. DHT meaning the dihydrotestosterone or androgens out there. And that's going to be a little bit more cosmetically friendly than ketoconazole or Nizoral. So um, what about hair care? What are your tips? I, someone wrote in, like, do you, is washing your hair every day okay? Is wax on the hair okay? What would you say? Yeah, so it's a magical question, right? And everybody wants this answer. What's appropriate in terms of how often they should shampoo and what should they be shampooing with? And so it's a very difficult question to answer because just like skin, your scalp is very personal. It's very unique. And it also changes with time. So the skincare regimen that you may use as a teenager or 20 year old is not the skincare regimen you're going to use as a 50 or 60 year old. And the same is true with, with the scalp. So the way to answer that question is to really have that trichology evaluation. So we need to look at the scalp under the microscope. We need to look at the scalp pH level, moisture level, sebum level, as we mentioned, um, to really take a look and decide what's the most appropriate type of hair care, you know, shampoo and conditioner, and the most appropriate frequency. But what I will tell you is that it's a myth that you're shampooing too much or too little, that there's no one right answer. Because if you're working out and you're getting, or you're using a lot of product in your hair, you need to shampoo that stuff out. You need to exfoliate the scalp. And many of our treatments at Amrit will have that exfoliation type of therapeutic intervention with it, for example. Um, but if you're shampooing too much and your scalp is um, a little bit more dry, you're not producing as much sebum, then you're going to have to use a more uh, deeper or more prolonged or what we say durable conditioner on the hair. If your hair is particularly coarse or curly or kinky, uh, if you have ethnic mm -hmm. hair, you're going to have to condition it to a much greater degree and be more gentle with it. I can't use conditioner. I have really fine hair. I cannot use conditioner because just if I do that. So it's individual. Also, yeah, very individualized. And remember, conditioners are like, you know, there's a whole range, right? So you can have a very lightweight conditioner on this end of the spectrum um, that doesn't weigh the hair down. So I encourage you to try one of those. The Bauman MD one might be good for you. Um, but then there's other conditioners that are literally more like creams, uh, you know, that again are so more, much more durable for, for thicker, coarser, curlier, kinkier hair. Um, well, you know, you're a very positive person and I can tell that from dealing with you and hair can make you feel you know, good or bad, depending on what's going on. Um, I also think that maybe changing a shampoo every so often is good because your scalp gets too used to it. I don't know your opinion on that. What do you think? You think? Well, I'm a bit of a, yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, a shampoo slut, as they say, you know, so I'll try something uh, new and different uh, just on a whim, maybe because of the way it lathers or smells. And, uh, you know, if it doesn't work for my hair, then obviously I'll make the switch back. But so, yeah, I do believe in rotating shampoos. Um, but, I, and, and that may also be because of the season. So if you live in an area where there's seasonal changes in humidity and temperature, um, it's very, very important. Your skin, your scalp is your skin. So treat it like skin, you know, so that you're going to have to, um, you know, adjust your shampoos and such, depending on your lifestyle factors, your environment, how you would like to style it. Um, and certainly, yeah, there may be shampoos that leave a certain type of residue and you need a clarifying shampoo or an exfoliation once in a while. And that's why these, tri this the whole science of trichology is so fascinating because, you know, every month we're learning something new and something different. Well, I will tell you that there's so many questions here, like laser caps, threading, theragome. We could go on and on, but we invite people to visit your website. Is that right? Yes, absolutely. So um, if you have a question about hair loss, uh, the best way to get an answer is from me at baumanmedical.com. So B-A-U-M-A-N medical.com is the, uh, the location, the website that patients should go to. 
uh, if they want to become a patient, I should say, and uh, they can request or schedule a consultation from anywhere in the world. Well, our last question, because we've really enjoyed your time. Tell us what during this shutdown has inspired you. What book, podcast, TED Talk, whatever, what's inspired you, Dr. Bob, that keeps so yes. positive? So, um, yeah, I listen to a lot of podcasts. So probably the best ones I would say during the pandemic are the physician ones. And, um, uh, you know, I, I try to stay positive. I'm a bit concerned about the censorship that's happening in big tech right now. Um, videos on YouTube and, and accounts on Twitter um, are being censored and removed. Videos are being removed and things like that. And, you know, whether you agree with some of those um, videos and content, uh, I think it's a I think it's a big mistake to remove content in that way uh, because we might find that uh, in a year from now that content might have been might have been very valuable and so uh, science is not um, it's not easy it requires it's you know and I think the general public has kind of realized that it's kind of messy right you know there's a lot of dissenting views and that's how we come to the truth right so there's multiple sides. It's a the journey. information, it's a journey. the journey. It's yes, the journey inside. to the truth is not. It's not a straight line, and uh, people look for scientific facts. And you know, uh, a good friend of mine and uh, someone I look up to, Dr. Peter Atia, always said, "Facts have a half life." And so, uh, I would encourage people to check out Dr. Peter Atia's podcast, "The Drive." He's amazing, intelligent, um, articulate physician who's really keen on longevity and has a unique. Uh, platform there in his podcast to uh, to um, you know investigate uh, all of these different things that not only affect us currently with with our with the pandemic, but also affect our lifestyle and our health. Everything from sleep to fasting, uh, which I'm a big believer in, to biohacking and all of that. So Peter so Atia is probably Peter Latia the Drive. At That's Atia A T T I A. Okay, the, Peter the Atia, time. and, and uh, probably the other one I would say would be Dave Asprey. Dave Asprey's Bulletproof podcast. He's probably the godfather or grandfather of biohacking, which is, uh, you know, he's not a physician, but took it upon himself to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to self-experiment on, uh, uh, you know, with different longevity techniques and health and wellness, I'm sure you know. And so uh, I'm a big fan of, of Dave Asprey as well. Um, and you like butter in your coffee, I take it. I, I do. <laughs> I just had it about two hours ago. It's I delicious and it. great. I try. I try. Well, and today, Onward's Facebook page has a nutrition Q&A because it does come back to you are what you eat in many ways, especially with the hair. So, Dr. Brown, we have to cut you off. We've gone way over our 10 minutes, but we wanted to because we had so many questions. So I look forward to seeing you in person soon and keep up the good work. Um, anyone can contact you. They can see your smiling face online just like us. So thank Thanks. you for your time. Thank you for having me. Really, it's been a great experience and I uh, hope we reached a lot of people today with some great information and you keep up the good work too. Yes, I will keep massaging my scalp. Okay, <laughs> talk to you later. All right, see you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now.